Chris Carnegie takes his weekly look at employment and training opportunities in the South with Employment Action at Midnight. Hello and welcome. Today's news that a hurricane has brought havoc in the Philippines with a loss of more than 200 lives serves as a sharp reminder of that hurricane which caused devastation across the south of England six weeks ago. And because of it, storm clouds of a different kind are now gathering over Westminster. A hundred Tory MPs are threatening a showdown with Mrs Thatcher. They want the government to pick up the tab for the cost of repairs with no strings attached. Mrs Thatcher has been told of a pending storm and she's not pleased. Andrew Bowden, MP for Brighton Kemptown, is not pleased with Mrs Thatcher and this two-page letter that he's received from her. In it, she seems to be offering just 75% of the repair bills and a list of provisos. Michael Howard, the Folkestone MP and Minister for Local Government, has now been brought into the row with a demand that he removes any threat of financial penalties on local authorities. But back to Andrew Bowden. He's one of the first MPs in the South to take up the issue with Mrs Thatcher and to make his views public. He explained why to Brian Shellcross. Andrew Bowden. You yourself have used pretty strong words. I mean, you've used the word disgraceful, scandalous. It is strong stuff, that, for a Conservative about his own government, isn't it? If we are seriously facing the situation where the government intend to actually penalise local authorities for money that they spend in dealing with the storm hurricane damage, that is disgraceful and scandalous. And I don't believe that many MPs in the South of England will put up with that. You obviously weren't satisfied with the letter you got from the Prime Minister because now you've written to Michael Howard, the local government minister, asking him to explain what she actually says. That's, that's a bit unusual, is it not? Not really. You, you write to the Prime Minister on issues of this sort where you feel very strongly. Clearly, if you write to the Prime Minister every other day or once a month, you're going to lose credibility. But where an issue comes up is of such importance to your constituents and to the area you represent, then you go direct to her. That shows your concern. She then will give you a broad answer, and then you follow that up in detail with the minister concerned. And that's where you've used words like disgraceful and scandalous, isn't it? If they are intending to continue with the policy of penalising local authorities, reducing their money because of money that they've actually spent on storm damage. OK, the $64,000 question now. If you don't get satisfaction from Michael Howard, what's the next move? I believe there will be a mass revolt by a large number of MPs in the south of England. We will work together, we will exert maximum pressure, and that will force the government to change its mind. What do you mean by maximum pressure? I mean, to the layman, what does that mean? What will you do? We can start tabling parliamentary motions. After all, if we represent 70 or 80 constituencies, all Conservative MPs, then the government will have to listen to us. Andrew Bowden running the risk of falling out with the Prime Minister. Another man who knows what it's like to get on the wrong side of the PM is Peter Rees, former MP for Dover, who rose to become Chief Secretary to the Treasury with a seat in the Cabinet. He fell from grace in a blaze of publicity and acrimony, and at the last election stood down as an MP. Now he's bounced back into politics, in what they describe in the Commons as another place. On Tuesday, Peter Rees took his seat in the House of Lords. The House of Lords is a unique blend of pomp, pageantry and practicality. A bastion, one would think, for Tory aristocrats and the ennobled gentry. But this is no longer a place where the Conservatives automatically command a majority. The Heath government of the early 70s suffered 26 defeats in the Lords, and since Mrs Thatcher has been in power, the number of defeats has long since passed the 100 mark. The former Dover MP, Peter Rees, will no doubt help the government in its efforts to get its latest and mammoth programme of legislation through the upper house. But of course, freed of general elections and constituency constraints, their lordships have a tendency to be less overtly loyal to the strict party line. 
Peter, morning. Sorry, morning. Well, Congratulations, um, not at all. Well. Yeah, hello, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome, obviously. Thank you, Lord Chancellor. <laughs> what actually happens now, sir? What, 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 what's the morning hold for you? What's the morning hold? I'm going to call on the Lord Chancellor, who, after all, is in a sense the Speaker uh, of the House of Lords, and I'm going to entertain my sponsors and my family to lunch. Then uh, we have a little bit of a rehearsal with Black Rod, and at 2.30 the ceremony takes place. We will talk to you again after the ceremony when you are a fully-fledged peer, and we look forward to that and, and hearing how the ceremony went and indeed seeing it. Right, Brown, I shall look forward to seeing you after Sir, the ceremony is over. Thank you very right, much. Goodbye. <laughs> The ceremony used for introducing new peers dates way back to 1601. Lord Rees has with him two peers who are acting as his sponsors, Lord Boyd Carpenter, who, like Lord Rees, was a former Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and Lady Young, who uh, was also with him in government. In his right hand, he carries his writ of summons. That's the document summoning him to Parliament, and without it, he can't take his seat on the red leather benches of the upper house. I, Peter Baron Rees, do swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. It was uh, a fascinating experience, a little intimidating, obviously. And I saw, of course, one or two old friends from the House of Commons that made me feel a bit more at home. Looked up the gallery, but I couldn't see my family there. But uh, no, it was a a very, very interesting experience, uh, and uh, heaved a sigh of relief when I realized I got through without uh, making too many awful mistakes. Well, now I can truly say, Lord Rees, the Lords is a more considered place, isn't it, than the Commons? There are debates without rancor, and uh, it's a chance to be more critical, but constructively critical of what's going on, and particularly of government policy. Will you be doing that, do you think? Oh, obviously I want to make a contribution. Uh, on the subjects where I feel I've got something to contribute. I want to obviously draw on my experience in government, and I don't think one would be doing one's job if one wasn't sometimes critical, sometimes supportive. Would you rather see more lords appointed like yourself, life peers who have experience, uh, have wisdom to bring to the place, rather than the uh, hereditary element? Oh, I think the hereditary element make a tremendous contribution so far as I can see, but I'm, after all, a complete newcomer. And there are, after all, some young and active peers uh, who could probably only get in by the hereditary system. Uh, people like myself are, after all, I won't say quite at the end of our careers, but we've had a lot behind us. <laughs> so I think you want a, want a blend, and I think that's where perhaps the hereditary system does allow uh, for some rather interesting contributions by younger younger members of the upper house. Let me put this to you, because a lot of peers I know from all sides of the house actually still hanker after the rough and tumble of, uh, as it's known, the other place down the corridor. They go back to their old haunts, they're seen in the commons lobby, they're seen in Annie's bar and so on. Do you miss the old place? Oh, of course. Uh, after all, if one's built one's life around it for something like 20 years, uh, it takes a little time to uh, adjust the fact that you're no, no longer a member of that club. But anyhow, it's nice to feel that one's in the same building. And as a former member of the Commons, I have got a right to, to go into some of the rooms there. I don't want to haunt them all the time, because I think it's wrong to go back all the time to places where you've uh, been active. But still, it's rather nice to feel that you do have a right of access. But uh, no, I want to, uh, to feel that a new chapter is opening and uh, devote myself to that. I must say, I, I, pure coincidence, I happened to meet an old friend from the Labour benches today who's, who's gone into the upper house a little before you, and I said, how are you settling in here? And he said, the thing that gets on my nerves is the gentility of the place. Do you think that'll get on your nerves? No, I think what got on my nerves towards the end in the Commons was the fact that there was, first of all, a lot of synthetic indignation and rowing, and secondly, a lot of blatant discourtesy. And I think you can have a very constructive and useful debate without necessarily being as rough as we were in the Commons. I plead guilty I was being as rough as anyone, but looking back, perhaps one regrets it. I was going to say, I mean, you've got a, a fairly waspish tongue if you, if you wish to have it. You, it obviously won't have a place in the Lords. Well, we'll wait and see. I've got to adjust to the uh, temperature and the atmosphere up here. Uh, but I, as far as I can see, uh, uh, the Lordships don't appreciate that kind of contribution. One would be less effective if you adopted 
tactics which are commonplace in the House of Commons. Lord Rees, if I can say that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Brian. Next Wednesday, Brian Gould, the Shadow Trade and Industry Secretary, will make a major speech to the House of Commons Press Gallery. His theme will be Labour's policy review, which is about to get underway. And a strategy for the South East is to be the subject of a special conference now being arranged for the weekend after next. If there's a Labour politician who knows this region more than most, it's Brian Gould. Back in the late 70s, he was MP for Southampton Test. And although he now sits for Dagenham, he's never lost interest in the South. Tonight, he's the subject of the Lou Gardner interview. Gould, uh, may we start by disposing of Ken Livingstone, perhaps? He's already had more yellow cards than Mark Dennis. Uh, and Mr. Kinnock has reminded him that he's not above party discipline. But isn't the fact of the matter is that nobody will really think that Labour's serious about him until he has the whip withdrawn? Well, Ken Livingstone has always held rather peculiar and idiosyncratic views on the Northern Ireland question. And I don't think it's realistic to expect him to change those views necessarily. What I think we are entitled to ask him is to recognise his responsibilities to the rest of the Labour movement and to exercise some judgment as to how and when he expresses those views. They're not the views of the Labour Party as a whole. And he's been uh, shown that, I think, very forcefully, uh, because uh, at every forum he's been present at, uh, that body, whether it's the National Executive Committee or uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party or whatever it might be... Were you there? made it very clear. Were you yeah, there? Oh, certainly. Was it, a, was it certainly. a fair old dressing down? No, I wouldn't uh, put it that way at all. I think there was a fair discussion of the matter. Mm -hmm. Ken spoke. Others spoke to rather different effect, and uh, Neil made it perfectly clear what the position of the party was, and made the point, which I think has got into the newspapers, to the effect that um, no one is above the normal rules of party discipline, however high in the National Executive Committee elections they he may, goes or may on, not have got. Sorry. If he goes on like this, though, would you be in favour of the whip being withdrawn from him, like no. Attlee did with Nye Bevan? No, I don't no. think. I don't think we're in the era of withdrawing whips, and I have every hope and expectation that Ken will settle down. He's a very new member of Parliament. He perhaps doesn't yet fully appreciate the nature of the uh, business he's in. I have every expectation that he's uh, going to turn out to be a very constructive force in, um, in the Labour Party and in the process of policy review, which we're about to undertake, and which incidentally he very much supports. All right, let's talk about the policy review. Uh, the fear of Dave Hill, one of our parliamentary candidates in Brighton Pavilion, one who did rather well, in fact, in the, in the election, he believes that the policy review may well end with the Labour Party simply being a social democratic party mark two. Are his fears justified? No, they're not justified, but I think they're understandable. I, I can understand why many people in the party, many activists, think that change must somehow mean going backwards and moving away from our principles, diluting the principles or abandoning our past achievements. I think that those people are wrong because in my book, change is the means by which we make our socialism more relevant, more attractive, we give it a sharper focus, a more radical cutting edge. If we don't change, if we insist on standing pat where we were and positions we took up 20, 30 years ago, we're dead. Will it We've be simply got to change if we want to, to make the progress to mm. put our socialism into practice. Will it be socialist in any real meaning of the word? I mean, will Clause 4, the commitment to public ownership, have any relevance in this new policy review? Absolutely, and indeed, let's, let's be very clear, since you raised the question of Clause 4, Clause 4 doesn't talk, as I'm sure you know, about public ownership or nationalisation. It talks about forms of common ownership, and that is exactly the sort of thing that I'm interested in. I want to see a whole range of forms of common ownership which can be extended right across the economy. Why should we be stuck? as Mrs. Thatcher wants us to be stuck, arguing simply about that one question as to where the dividing line should be drawn between the public sector and the private sector. Why shouldn't we be looking for forms of social ownership, workers' cooperatives, workers' shareholding schemes, effective regulation, use of pension funds, and many, many ideas that we could be using to extend right across uh, the economy so that we are achieving the objectives of social or common ownership uh, not just in the public sector, but in all forms of economic activity. But old forms of public ownership, of nationalisation, no, no, are, are no. out of the window. No, 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 I haven't said that either. And no. Indeed, that's certainly not my view. At a time when Mrs Thatcher is privatising everything and is threatening now to privatise water and electricity against the overwhelming weight of public opinion, and when her own privatisation programme up until now with British Telecom, BP, has come unstuck, this is not the moment for the labour movement to be abandoning its view that there are major parts of our economy
to do with the natural utilities, the great monopolies. You, you take those back. You those, still take those, those back. Our view is that those ought to be in some form of public ownership. Now, when you say, should we take them back, uh, simply because Mrs. Thatcher has taken them into private ownership, that's exactly the sort of question which we're now going to be looking at in terms of our policy review. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what the outcome of that is, because I simply don't know at this point. Okay. But all I'm saying is that our principle is clear. We believe that those parts of the economy are best dealt with under some form of public ownership. Now, can you have policies that are relevant to the and attractive to the people in the South, the more affluent South, and also attractive to uh, Eric Heffer's people in the North, who he says want red-blooded socialism? Can mm. you have policies that attract both these people? Well, I think we can. And let, let me just first make a point, which I think very often commentators and politicians, for that matter, lose sight of. We, we, we're in danger of running away with the idea that everybody in the North or everybody in Scotland voted Labour and nobody in the South voted Labour. What we're talking about are really differences of degree. More people in the North or in Scotland or in Wales uh, understood what we were uh, really supporting and were about and fewer in the South. But it's, it's, it's that sort of margin that we're talking about, not the impossibility of making Labour popular in the South. Now, what I think we have to do if we are to make that appeal to people in the South is to say that we understand that there are many people in the South who feel that they've done relatively well. They feel that almost uh, against the evidence, but we're accustomed in this country to doing so badly that merely being in work and having a regular annual wage increase is regarded as doing pretty well. It wouldn't be regarded as doing well anywhere else necessarily, but we think that's okay. The Labour Party has tended to say to those people that as they do well, as they begin to buy their own homes, perhaps have some savings, look for more freedom of choice, we, we've tended to say, or to appear to say, we're not interested in you any longer. We're only concerned with defending the defenseless and protecting the disadvantaged. Now, of course that's our major responsibility. That's what we exist in politics to do. No one else will look after the disadvantaged. But we've got to understand that we can't protect the defenseless unless we enlist the support of at least some of those people who feel that they're doing relatively well. And I think we've got to say to them, we want you to do well. We understand your success. We want to encourage you to succeed. But part of being successful is to live in a society that looks after everybody to a decent standard. OK, now, can we talk about uh, councils in the South, four mm. Labour councils in the South? Mm. Rather sort of marooned there, no MPs at all. They're the, they're the bastions of Labour's support in the South. What do you see their role? They carry the banner, if you like, of a certain view of local government. Local government which has been so bravely attacked by the Tories. I think what Labour councils now do is not just do the things on the ground that they think are important, but actually show what they believe is the importance of local government, because Mrs. Thatcher believes that local government has no real role. And power with responsibility now, perhaps rather than irresponsibility that we've seen sometimes in the past? Well, I think, I think Labour councils, by and large, you know, as to 90, 95% of them, have always been very responsible. If you look around the country, they've been doing very good things and you continue take my to point. do so. But I think that there will certainly Quickly. be a sense of uh, financial responsibility now, which, uh, which is forced upon them. It's a constraint which I think is unfair and unfortunate and means bad services for their communities. But that's the context in which they now have to operate. Brian Gould, thank you very much for joining us on Agenda. Thank you very much. Well now, what are the South MPs up to next week? And what's on their minds? To find out, here's Brian Shalcross. Well, coming up at Westminster next week, a full debate on Kenneth Baker's education reform bill, as well as the housing bill, which relaxes rent controls and allows council house estates to become private housing associations. I also expect the Commons to come up with a procedural means of finally appointing these select committees, which monitor where the government departments work. This has been held up by the row over Labour's choice of MPs with CND sympathies to serve on the Defence Select Committee. There'll be a debate next week, after which the committee should be appointed to start work in the new year. Now, scanning the Commons order paper, I was intrigued by a couple of written questions to the Home Secretary, tabled for answer next Tuesday, by Portsmouth North MP Peter Griffiths. They concern sex shops. Some time ago, the government passed legislation defining strict rules and regulations about how sex shops should be operated. No public displays of goods sold, plain windows, so nothing could possibly offend passers-by. 
Well, from the tone of Mr. Griffiths's questions, it seems that other shops are now beginning to sell what he refers to in his questions as sex toys, but only as a small proportion of the total value of sales, so they aren't obliged to abide by the rules governing sex shops. Mr. Griffiths sees this as a way of getting round the law. I asked him how he thought the matter should be resolved. The intention of Parliament was that there should be strict control of se sex shops through licensing. And what is happening in Portsmouth is that uh, there is an attempt being made to sell the items that used to be sold in sex shops through other forms of retail outlets. And the worst of all worlds, what are called sex toys, are now being offered for sale in a toy shop which means that when parents and children go in to buy their Christmas toys, they are faced with these items. And what is worse, the kind of uh, people who buy those items are also in the shops where there are lots of children. The intention of the law was that this should not happen, and I am determined that we shall see it brought to an end. So I am asking the Home Secretary to make it quite clear that there is a minimum proportion of sex items which, if they are sold in an ordinary retail outlet, still require a licence. We must stop this before it spreads. Now, as we come up to Christmas, shops get crowded and the amount of shoplifting soars. The major stores in Basildon have just launched a massive campaign to make the public more aware of this, and it's uh, so impressed the town's MP, David Amis, He'll bring the scheme to the notice of Home Secretary Douglas Hurd next week. Mr Amos is keen for this kind of local initiative to be copied elsewhere, so I asked him to explain how the scheme works in Basildon and also what he'll tell Mr Hurd on Thursday. We've recently launched a scheme in Basildon called Stop It, and it's right that it should have been launched in Basildon because we have the biggest covered shopping centre in Europe. And as such, unfortunately, theft from stores is on the increase. And we thought that it was a good idea before Christmas to create greater public awareness of this. And I brought this to the attention of the Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd, in the hope that uh, if uh, thefts from stores in Basildon decreases, it's something that he might encourage a greater publicity for uh, in other parts of the country. The whole point of the scheme is to alert people that... Uh, stealing things from shops is just as bad as stealing things from people's houses and at the end of the day things that are stolen means that uh, increased costs are put onto the goods you purchase now in last week's agenda we looked at a commons adjournment debate held on friday when thanet mp roger gale raised the way in which cinemas operate a big cinema showing four films effectively prevents a smaller single screen cinema nearby from showing any of those four films at the same time. That means the poor old local cinema suffers a decline. And frankly, backbenchers who raise matters like this in an adjournment debate don't go into the chamber expecting to come out with ministerial replies solving the problems. Surprisingly, though, junior trade minister John Butcher came out with a positive decision and a jubilant Roger Gale told me how the minister's reply will benefit cinema goers. You're absolutely right in saying that it's very rare for a minister to make a statement of this kind in reply to an adjournment debate. What John Butcher has said is that, given consultation between now and the end of January, the department expects to abolish the barring contract, which prevents small exhibitors from showing the most recent films, and also to restrict the first run in major cities to four weeks. So effectively, a cinema in the West End will have four weeks to show a film, uh, after that, it should be free for all, and that's got to be good news for the independents. And right now, as we speak, MPs will be debating what financial support opposition parties should receive from public funds. Normally, it's a virtual formality for the House to vote sizable sums for the opposition to meet its running costs. But tonight, there's an amendment tabled by Canterbury MP Julian Brazier, who's being backed by several Southern MPs. In the light of recent events, like Mr. Tam Diel and Mr. Daffod Wigley being thrown out of the House for breaking Commons rules, the MPs want opposition money reduced by £1,500 a year every time one of their MPs misbehaves in this way. We could yet end up being a one-party state, Chrissy. 
Thank you, Brian. Mind you, it can sometimes be a bit of fun to see MPs ribbing each other. There was a very good seasonal example of this on questions which came from Midhurst last Monday. A questioner wanted to know what panellists would give each other for Christmas. Norman Tevitt started the batting against Shadow okay. Chancellor. John so Smith. I'd like to give John something. I'd like to give John a job outside politics because he's <laughs> never going to get... <laughs> He's never, he's never going to get a decent one in politics, you see. Well, well, John, what do you think about that? Well, I was even going to be even nicer to Norman than he was to me. I'm going to give him a red rose. Um, <laughs> Soon they'll be telling us they're just good friends. And finally, after recapturing the Isle of Wight from the Liberals, Barry Field, the new Tory MP, promptly announced that they'd have a victory ball. It was to have been held tomorrow night, but has been cancelled owing to lack of support. Just as well it didn't happen in the election. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>